Uh, yes, this will be recorded and uh, you can slice your dice. You're clicking record, right? Uh, no, it's just okay. they, it's just being constantly oh, recorded. It's just yeah. the whole meeting. Okay, the whole day. Yep. I, okay, that works for me. So yep. uh, today, uh, we're tonight for me. I don't know where everyone else is coming from. These virtual ones, I was talking to my wife because I have uh, two little kids now. And uh, she's like, why are you presenting so late? And I'm like, well, technically it's virtual. Normally I'd be down in, down in, the, uh, down in Chicago at this point in time, but nope, it's tonight. So I got people from all over the world. Uh, hopefully I get some out there. But uh, today I'll be talking more about security and compliance, uh, really all about what's new. So this is really gonna be more uh, educational around the stuff in probably the last three months. So from Ignite on uh, up to yesterday, or in best definitely this week, there's been um, a couple smaller things, but I'm gonna go into the details and some of the uh, of each of the things that I, I'm highlight. I'm gonna highlight uh, the things that should be affecting you or that you kind of need to start planning for or be aware of uh, in the last couple months as it relates to security and compliance. So a little bit about uh, me. So uh, I. My name is Drew Metaling. I'm actually up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So, a uh, large Packers fan. I'm sorry for all the Bears fans down there, whoever's coming from Chicago. Um, yeah, I was just going to reject your session because of that, by the way. <laughs> Craig, did you look at my email? You didn't see the slides before, though, but I pretty much used that same picture of the of it. I mean, I was about to do like a full session on just like how the Packers are going to win the Super Bowl this year. Uh, and how uh, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to be one and done. No chance. <laughs> Um, but Sorry, I, I couldn't help that, but <laughs> jump in and give you a little bit of good. To, yeah, good to see you, Craig, man. Uh, so thanks for, presenting. I mean, thanks last... for everybody for coming. This is the last session of the day. Sorry, I don't want to cut you out, but we're not really going to have like a closeout or anything. So when you're done, um, thanks again for coming and uh, we appreciate it. Thanks, Craig, for setting it up virtually. I know and helping these things. It's quite a it's it's a lot of work behind the scenes that you we don't see here, especially with this many sessions and this many tracks. So. This is one of the biggest ones I've ever seen, and that's really awesome, Craig, that you, you did. You guys put yeah, that all together. Uh, we got a lot more people, and then I <laughs> expected to submit. So then um, we've always prided. I mean, we've been doing this for, I think you were the first one, right, 2013? So, no, I looked at it. So I remember I was attending. The first one I spoke at was wow. 2015. So we sponsored, and we're, I was there. But 2015 was the first session I did. I actually found my slides today, and I was just playing them before. Yeah. And so for you, those people who don't was, know, pre-COVID, we actually used to do this live, and it was SharePoint Saturday, Chicago suburbs, um, and then COVID made us go virtual. But uh, we've been doing this. This is our 11th event um, and eighth year that we've been doing it. And again, uh, concurrency is always well. No, um, concurrency ain't provided productivity, but has been uh, partners with us before. Um, me and Drew worked together for a little bit of time, so that's why we we know each other and. Just an all-around great guy. We again, we appreciate everybody coming here, and hopefully, we'll get to hybrid or something next year. Yeah, this is my sixth one, Craig. If you're curious, six times uh, speaking with you guys. So next time, I will make a. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to count them up and do like I got, a seven. Year I gotta wait till I get to. Yeah, I gotta go wait till I get to set, ten. Is like my year, so 2025 when we get there, we'll definitely be fully in person. I'll be hanging out with you guys again, not stuck in my basement. So hey, are you going to Seattle? I'll be in Seattle. Yeah, I'll see you there then because I'm presenting there too. Sweet. It may 5th, I think, 6th, something like that. Yes. That good. Yeah, that'll be exciting. I haven't been to Seattle in a couple of years either, so be a good one. I have never been, but I'll let you get to it because I know that people don't want to hear me and you just chat, so <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, so I mean, the uh, newest thing with me, uh, in kind of presenting around the side of the world, I have two new kids, uh, two under two. I can hear them upstairs right now, uh, and that is quite an adventure if anyone's done that uh, I am but in my job I guess for what I do uh, so I'm a Microsoft 365 consultant uh, I help uh, usually large organizations and I've been in, in the regulated industry now for uh, going on three years a lot of financial services clients insurance um, banking uh, healthcare, things that require uh, some public uh, some publicly um, public utilities uh, some energy companies so things that require very specific information protection, information governance rules, and that's kind of moved me in fr more from SharePoint on-prem and just architecture work into a lot of security and compliance work as it relates to as it relates to M365 and, and kind of evolving into security as a whole. Uh, but what I'm gonna, again, what I'm gonna go through today is really security and compliance. I'm gonna try to hit some demos. I'm not, a lot of the stuff is, is like brand new, so if I don't get to a lot of them, I'm, uh, 
this is where going to be a lot of slide content about what is out there and hopefully it gives you some materials to come back and look on after the fact uh, so you can kind of see what's what's really coming what to think about this though we need to think about when we're thinking about security and compliance is how our our technology stack is changing as it relates to m365 so if anyone's an administrator or managing their tenants you need to think about security and compliance differently because of the way that we had we had been working and, I, and this isn't just pre-covid this is just in general the nature of uh, the nature of work um, is is moving forward and a lot of that has to do with the accessibility and the uh, the remote capability of content so in the past we had very specific corporate networks corporate firewalls people would call it the castle policies where you would have you'd have to be on vpn you have to be on network you have to be in the office you have to use these browsers like very locked down types of information and what was interesting like the signals and the data coming into your environment was very specific to uh, really kind of tied to you and there was almost this higher level of security by obscurity with your organization because just because it wasn't you might not have been protected in certain areas but you never really had to because users didn't want to do it and you might not have thought that was a potential chance for for breach or a potential chance for data exposure a lot of times or what we see here a lot of is miss not not even just misinformation or, or exposure outside of the organization exposure inside of the organization um, a lot of one a lot of companies have rules that like this person can't talk to this person for specific reasons think of conflict of interest rules um, those need to be protected and that all kind of follows in this this realm of people want that what they want when they want it uh, it's all going to be in the cloud and you're going to be accessing from anywhere. So all of that has evolved into the world of security and appliance that we need to sit in with M365. And starting with security, I, I like to think about this all still with the zero trust principles. And how do you ensure, like, if I'm starting from scratch, if I'm saying where do I want to go with M365 security, use these kind of pillars and if you use that zero trust mindset which is really that assume breach mindset you're going to build your your platform to support that so you're about verifying the explicitity of who's coming in like what are they coming in to do you're going to make sure that the people who have administrative access or even regular user access are using this privilege and when you see content you're going to assume breach you're going to assume that what if this account what if uh this was breached what would happen uh when you follow those, those principles, you get into this concept of ensuring you have strong authentication, right? So I'm not going to talk about it, but make sure you have MFA enabled as much as you can across the board. Uh, legacy authentication is just needs, it's very gone. If it's still enabled in your tenants, it's primarily exchange focused, but make sure you have authentication processes to uh, to move, to keep you secure. That That's the, one of the first lines of defense. Adaptive access is really about when and who so i only want these specific people instead of saying i want teams to be available everywhere it's going to be okay well maybe we want these specific files on these team sites and these people on these devices to access this so you get moved into these layers of like if this then this so you're going to say based on these scenarios i'm then going to grant you access and then when i grant you access i'm still going to have that strong authentication i'm still going to have that mfa requirement I'm still going to have that device based requirement like um, think of your phone with think with uh, with fingerprints or or biometrics right that's an authentication that moves you to say if I do this then it can do this and if I have that you're to get that you're really managing different endpoints right? so I'm actually managing these devices whether it's man policies MDM policies BYOD policies you're you need to make sure you think about all the endpoints that are accessing your your environment so starting that as like the the pillar of why this is important. Uh, I thought about the numbers. I mean, when working with organizations and seeing breaches, I mean, I've been a part of a ransomware uh, environment recently. Like there, these things will happen. These things can happen. Will happen um, externally and then both internally. Uh, the scenarios where people uploaded files into public Gamer sites, uploading passwords into into their OneDrive and access and sharing it. Right there are scenarios that you are is going to happen, whether it's malicious or not. And securing and, and complying to those regulations is definitely going to be important. So I'm going to start now kind of going down what's new. And the first one that is important to know is a, a, a rename around the security suites. So uh, we are moving into the world of Defender, uh, Defender for All. So 
think of um, basically we had multiple separate types of products and they're moving them under a the products aren't changing so they're still the same products in the back end they're from an administration standpoint though and a branding standpoint the unification of it is definitely going to be helpful is in my opinion actually very helpful to explain what these do so for the big ones that really stem 365 uh, we now have defender for 365 so instead of atp it's defender um, defender for endpoint defender for uh, 365 or sorry threat protection is now microsoft 365 defender so we have a more consistent label in here and actually the the last one i that we have is now defender for cloud apps so microsoft cloud app security uh, rebranded into defender for cloud apps uh, this is an area that is definitely has been seen a lot of growth in the past uh, for, well for a period of time but very recently has been some nice additions to it other than the rename, uh, but this is Microsoft's CASB solution. So the cloud app security broker solution that you have to basically control multiple layers. So I could say, I want to, if someone has a piece, has a file that's labeled and I'm uploading it to Salesforce, I, I want to stop them or I want to protect it. I want to inspect that content. Um, that's it's one of its kind of core sick core goals. And then it's really adjusting all the signals that your users are going out into. But one of the new things that's out there now is what's called app governance. So app governance for Defend for Cloud Apps actually lets us start to manage uh, applications using Defender. Uh, this allows us to create permission policies around it, get better insights on what uh, the apps that are being used inside of your environment. Um, and a lot of these are normally the third party apps that you have. This isn't, uh, this would be, think of a, I mean, look at the screenshots here. So think of these different apps that are kind of coming through in your environment that are going to put, have access or have permissions into your environment. They, a lot of them are going to be third parties. Almost all of them are third parties. Um, and now you can start to add policies and permissions around that, which are very helpful to see who's accessing what, what are they doing? And then that's kind of been there, but now you can say, what should we do with it? And how can we manage that? So uh, that is a different license that is kind of extended side of Defender for Cloud Apps now or MCAS, but it's definitely something that is going to be very helpful for us to govern all our applications. I'm going to talk a good amount about sensitivity labels here, so I want to make sure I set the table of what sensitivity labels are under the security and compliance umbrella. So they're under, when we think about security and compliance, sensitivity labels give us the ability to add information protection onto different pieces of content. Uh, this can go from files, this can go to sites, this can now go into Power BI, this can now, and stretching out into Azure Purview and, and uh, Azure SQL as we, as, as we, if we wanted to. These all live under the Microsoft Information Protection Suite, and under that suite you, you also have Information Governance, which I'll talk about, the Defender Suite around it, uh, but really think of sensitivity labels as the ability for us to classify and protect our information. So I can grab a file, I can classify it with something, and I can that could protect it from, let's say, leaving this organization. Now, one of the bigger changes that was announced actually uh, this week is that, oh, well, actually this week, very recently, is that the AIP Unified Labeling Client is actually going to go into maintenance mode. So if anyone has deployed sensitivity labels, has uh, is running with them, and is using the Unified Labeling Client, uh, they're not, the key thing is it's not being unsupported. So. The labeling client is gives you the ability to uh, perform some more advanced actions. It's also the scanner. That the advancements for sensitivity labels, if you haven't used them, they're actually being uh, fully ingested into Office in the Office apps themselves. So you don't need to have this client installed on all your workstations. They're going to be fully supported inside of the Office client. They are today, uh, but there are some very specific scenarios that you might need the client. But it's important to note that the client, uh, the 213, which went live uh, this week, two days ago is going to be the last version with new features. It's going to be going into maintenance mode. And with that, we also have the AAP mobile viewer uh, going away. So if you're using mobile app, like encryption on mobile apps, um, there's going to, you'll be in a scenario where you need to move to the uh, built-in apps to use those. And hopefully no one's had a, still done this, but if you're still using the classic labels that are not sensitivity labels, uh, it is really going away at, at this March.
screen down uh, the sensitivity label side. This is, and you'll see as I kind of walk through it into, I can do a demo there, but they have some examples of where you'll see it in, in these slides here. But you, we now have in this, this came, this was announced at Ignite, and um, probably one of the biggest changes if you've done sensitivity labels is that you can now do co-authoring with them if they're encrypted. So you had this scenario of if I grabbed a file, let's say I marked it as highly sensitive and added encryption to it so that only people in my organization could get to it. If that was the case, the ability for co-authoring, which has become just synonymous with working in, in 365, that actually wasn't available. So now it is. You do need to update to a newest version, uh, the newer version of M365 apps or a new version of Mac OS. And then if you go flip it on, in your tenant, there's a big master switch there in the picture. And when you switch that on, that's going to enable co-authoring inside of your uh, encrypted files. What's important to note, the reason why there's a master switch for this one is because it actually changes the the metadata behind the scene. So if I label a con, let's say I grab a file, I mark it as highly sensitive, or an email as highly sensitive is a better example. The way that the metadata is stored in that, let's say if you have a semantic or a proof point or another tool kind of dissecting it, that's going to change, so you have to account for it. It's really, you need to make sure you make this change and you're aware of it if you have uh, sensitivity labels out there. But if you have sensitivity labels and you have encryption, this is a must have that you should work put into your go to make sure it gets deployed. It will make your users very happy. We, for the administrative side, I talked about least privilege. Uh, we finally get some administrative rules for it. So instead of having to do like security, uh, security reader or center security or security, um, admin compliance admin we now have the ability to grant information protection admins analysts and readers so people wanting to go visit uh, investigate information about label files that have been classified you can do that without having to grant them some very high level access so uh, very helpful to move towards that least privileged world the one i see most using the most actually can be the role groups so if we have people that you're going to have multiple IP admins or people that are going to be managing sensitivity labels, uh, you can put them all into that group and not have to deal with, um, let's say, analysts who want to look at help. Uh, let's say if the help desk people come in, they want to look at the configurations of it. You can do that from a reader side versus having to give them admin. Very helpful. When, when, when you create sensitivity labels and you deploy them, so this would be this is the example of what a sensitivity label looks like. Uh, you have the ability, you had the ability to make it default, um, but that default actually would only occur on a new document. Now, when you create a new default sensitivity, if I create a new default sensitivity label, I can actually have it go to a modified document. So very specific, very unique to if, I'm, if I've done uh, default labels, which I do recommend, by the way, I, my goal, my gut is and the work I've done for a lot of customers for sensitivity labels is going to the default. And this was kind of a gut, this was kind of a pain. Um, they'd open up a, a file and then the default wouldn't be there. If it was an old file that was never labeled, now we'll have that. So it's a good catch up to if you deploy labels and, you, and people are working on older content, uh, we will now get the ability to have default sensitivity labels available. For anyone that's done auto labeling, so Manual label uh, for sensitive labels, you can always manually classify them or automatically classify them. The automatic classification uh, in 365 had a, I would just call it a, a st uh, capacity issue because this does all of the scanning for you. So I could basically say, find me all the content in these SharePoint sites that have, if they have social security numbers, mark them as highly sensitive. That that could that would be a, a type of policy that you could create. Unfortunately, in the past, they were limited by scale, so I could actually only put up to 100 sites in my environment, and I have to scale them in to uh, to add my auto classification or my auto labeling. Now I can do all, so very helpful for mass deployment of auto classification. This was definitely a big gap that I want to talk with people about having. I want to put this all out there. I want to basically classify all this stuff automatically across my entire environment because this is my classification policy. Now we can do it. So this uh, this one does require that you, anything that uh, uses automation does require up step licensing for AIP or for basically automatic classification. I think is what it's under, but definitely helpful for the large scale. 
and you can and you can target that too. By the way, I, I go back there, but you can actually still target it to a specific set of sites if you have it, or specific OneDrives. But the all would be really the catch-all, and you can kind of mirror those together. So sensitivity labels for sites. So when I create sites uh, or teams, uh, I'm also have the ability to add a scope for that label. So I can say if I create this this site, I want this site to have a label. And then that label is going to be doing something. So let's say I create a site that's called highly sensitive uh, and I want to add protections around that. So we now have the ability to uh, put what's called granular conditional access on sites. So think of this scenario. I create a site that's called highly sensitive. I create a site that's highly sensitive or I created a label. Sorry, a label that's called highly sensitive. Anytime someone creates a team and they mark it as highly sensitive, uh, I want to ensure that no matter where you are, or, or I could say maybe just externally, I want to require MFA. Or maybe I want to block access externally. The big one I think is MFA though. I think that's a, the example in this, in this here is uh, someone creating a label and you'll see right there that I can actually go in and choose what's called an authentication context. And I can then set this authentication context and say anyone who hits this context, so I can hit this site and it's going to uh, launch and prompt for MFA. Because I'm going to that site with that label and it's something that you can really start to get more very granular with your policy. So we think about that, going back to that zero trust, I can get very specific with the explicit, uh, very explicit with the sites and the permissions that I can grant per each of those sites. This one's pretty cool. Um, this one that I've, I have used and it is, uh, you can, it's MFA is a big one, but think of anything you can really do in conditional access, you can start to trigger here. So maybe I could say, I want to block Win7 devices. You can do that as well. This one's uh, newer, but not as new. So when I create sensitivity labels for sites, you do have the ability to uh, set default sharing. So uh, I could have one site, say people in my organization has a default link. I could go to another site and I could say that has everyone or that is confidential. So I want that to default to, uh, let's say specific people, right? So I don't need to, right, so this is defaulting to specific people versus defaulting to uh, people in my organization. So a very quick way that you can classify sites, uh, label sites and say, really start to minimize the risk of, yeah, minimize the risk of people oversharing. So if, I, if I've defaulted to people in my organization, that could lead to oversharing. If I've defaulted to specific people, good chance that you're not going to. Jumping into DLP a little bit. So that's a, um, by the way, if any of you have questions, just. I can pause there for a second if anyone has any questions on sensitivity labels wants to talk while I grab a drink of water before I jump into DLP. If anybody has any questions and can't put them in the chat, I would rather ask you. Just raise your hand and I'll unmute your mic. Perfect. So jumping into DLP, uh, this is also is an MIP space. There's been a bunch of updates around DLP. Uh, the first one is around uh, file type. So if we haven't been able, what we can now do actually is I could control the sharing of content. So DLP at this point is the data in transit. So I email a file out, it's a core example, right? I email, I send an email out and it has a AutoCAD attachment, or maybe more specifically, I'm thinking of it has uh, file uh, file types that could be code, right? .sln files, uh, .txt files could be an example. Basically, you can start to go in and, and protect content based on that file type now and control it, which has always been something that other products could do. Or if I went into specifically into exchange rules, I could, I could get pretty close to that. But now I can actually do it in the unified DLP space based on file extension. Along with that, I uh, was if you think about the different file types that can be blocked. So in the past, I've actually worked in trying to block zip files from being exposed in certain ways because you can package things in those and those consider archive files. And but now uh, you can actually you'll see in this example you see in the screenshot right here actually zip files are now able to be protected. So if I have sensitive information inside of those uh, zip files or archive files, it can actually get to those and uh, stop you from being able to move them. In the example here, you're seeing an endpoint DLP. So if I move it, uh, this is actually moving a file between a network share or attaching to a Bluetooth device 
or moving in uh, an unallowed browser, it can actually catch that. So if I tried to package something in a zip file and, and be malicious, it would get it would get caught. There was, uh, as far as DLP, uh, the way that there's one scenario that was kind of a, a pain if anyone's deployed this is around uh, the quarantine of content. So when things get caught, uh, they do they can get quarantined. They will get quarantined. Now, if you have apps, uh, very specific, let's say OneDrive, that is going to keep trying to perform a specific action. Let's say if I put a file of sensitive content in my desktop and I have my desktop synced to the cloud, it's going to keep trying to upload this file and be like, and then. And if it has sensitive information, it could be like, nah, stop it. You're not supposed to put that in OneDrive. So uh, the ability to stop that, it wasn't a good way. So now what we can do is what's called auto quarantine. And auto quarantine is going to allow it to, uh, if it continuously gets blocked, you can, uh, it would replace it with the file or move it. So it's not actually going to keep prompting and throwing a specific error. Interestingly. When I'm uh, creating uh, these policies or I'm creating these restrictions, one thing I, I couldn't do is say, uh, if I wanted to allow these people to get to, uh, a good example could be, I want to allow my developers to still get to GitHub while I want my non-developers not to not get to GitHub. Because right? that could be a scenario where we're using the GitHub desktop client or using the GitHub app or I want to allow only the certain people to get to it while these other ones can't. And that gives you, again, more of that least privilege idea of only these people have the right ability to do certain things. And from an endpoint perspective, I can now say, great, developers, you can work with Git whenever you want. You can install it. That's fine. Hey, Drew, you're not a developer. If Git gets involved on your machine and you try to do anything with it to bring it out, so I put anything in Git and tries to let it, let it run, that would get blocked. Uh, you could do that for other applications. Think of maybe like Notepad++ if people wanted to try to add uh, add apps out there or add some of your own custom ones. We can also now customize the policy tips. So, on the, and this is all endpoint, right? So over my endpoint side. So when I create a file and on my desktop, and if I have endpoint TLP create, um, uh, deployed and I wanted to block files from moving off my endpoint, think of this as, I, a perfect example is I have a file on my desktop that's marked as highly sensitive. Right? Bring this with a sensitivity label concept. So I create a file on my desktop. It's called highly sensitive with the highly sensitive label. I want to make sure that that highly sensitive file does not leave my organization. Endpoint TLP can say I want to in that same example of OneDrive, but right? I could say I don't want it to go to Salesforce. I don't want to go to these domains or I want to block it from going into an untrusted location. When that happens, now you can give people a policy tip to say, hey, you weren't supposed to do that. Uh, we identified that there's project information here, that there's critical information in here, sensitive information, and we want to stop you and give the end user a little better feel for that. So now uh, I am running, this one is it's newer, but it is live. I have some uh, customers working with this one today, actually, and it works just fine. And you can actually put, the nice thing about this, you can put, a, and I don't know the word for it, not tags, but like, uh, replacement item. So I could say like uh, percentage file name percentage. So I could say then it the user would see the file name of the file uh, versus just the text that I wrote. And probably the biggest one announcement uh, from a deal endpoint DLP side is that it's now supported on Mac OS. So this one uh, endpoint DLP was specifically a Windows product for an extended period of time. It's built into Windows. Uh, now you can enroll your tenant to have it support Mac OS. And when you onboard those Mac OS devices, you'll actually get uh, this experience of being able to identify sensitive information in Office on the Mac and be able to stop it following uh, some specific DLP policy that you have. So much less tech, tech agnostic. If you deployed endpoint DLP, if you haven't, it's good to know that Mac is Mac is alive and well in this space. Jumping back more um, specifically to OneDrive and SharePoint, uh, we do have what's now what's called continuous access evaluation available. And this one is not something you're ever going to see, uh, not something that you have to turn on, uh, but just a platform upgrade that is making your environment more secure. So 
and actually had this happened to a customer uh, in my in one of my customers where someone leaves the organization uh, for a specific reason and if they do uh, and if you let's say have conditional access enabled to say hey after you uh, after we've changed your password um, you sorry if they still have a session established that user actually came back in and was able to come back and download a bunch of information and we saw it in the logs but unfortunately it was after their account was disabled and it was before their their token was uh, was revoked now that would have been stopped if we had what was called what's called continuous access evaluation which says depending on certain triggers so password change is the easiest one uh if someone's passwords changes within a very very short period of time i'm talking uh, seconds to minutes that if a user tries to get back in it will expire that session uh, so it won't be as waiting as something does happen if there's risk in your organization you're always going to be more up to date with with any of the blocks that you've put in place so this has been around for this was around for exchange and now it is uh, ga for sharepoint and onedrive so you'll see this if you have um uh, you see this if you have deployed that if you have really have mainly using conditional access um, but you'll get the you get kicked out really quick as you can see in that video So a little less compliancy, very SharePoint specific. Uh, this comes up a little bit because I've have had it come up in compliance conversations uh, around domain change. So if anyone created their tenants, like an IT department created their tenant specifically for no reason, and then they've been living in that tenant, or if there was a more primarily like a merger or acquisition, you can actually change your SharePoint URL. So it's called tenant rename. Uh, so you could change like drew.sharepoint.com to pizza.sharepoint.com. You can actually do that now. Uh, this was in, this is fully in public preview. So you could go in and start to try this today. If you really want to go rename your domain. It does a bunch of redirects behind the scene. And there's a big article that you'll read about the impacts of it because of uh, some of the behind the scene work, but it works. On a starting to move more to the team side, what one of the scenarios that we do have now is um, in the compliance center. So the compliance center is where we go to manage a lot of our information around compliance. The security center is where we, we talked about a lot of some of the stuff I just, I just did. Um, when you're looking at identifying information inside of your environment, and what we've had is what's called the content explorer and activity explorer. The a content explorer actually lets you go out and let's say find sensitive information that's on a specific site and go all the way to that to that content itself. So let's say I found so let's say I've done a uh, I want to say what locations have social security numbers and what are those files. And if I wanted to have a legal team or a uh, threat team come look at this, I could come in and say they could actually drill all the way into the specific locations, identify the that 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 content, uh, download it, export it, look at it. And that was primarily in that was only in SharePoint OneDrive and Exchange before, and now we have Teams. So this is your chat data that's going to be out there uh, if people start to with like Teams DLP. Um, I'm going to see that in here. So if I started to chat, I'm not, I shouldn't say using DLP. DLP is a type of engine that triggers it, but uh, if I'm starting to chat with a, let's say I'm putting social security numbers in Teams chat, that's going to start to show up here. Which has been, which will be helpful for people to dive into that info. Staying in the reporting side of this, so not specifically SharePoint and OneDrive, but I wanted to make sure I touched on Activity Explorer. No big changes for our, for SharePoint and OneDrive and Activity Explorer. This actually will let us see all the activity happening in your environment. So I could say uh, when a file is applied, when a file is changed, when a label is applied. Um, good for investigation down here. Like if there's a deal, DLP rule match, we'll see it. But it really, it did only exist with SharePoint OneDrive, SharePoint OneDrive here, and your devices if you had them onboarded. Now we can start to see them in Power BI. And this is important because as sensitivity labels become more pertinent across all of M365, now fully supported in Power BI, you want to make sure you know what which of your data is classified and which one's not. So this will help you identify who's labeling, one is being labeled, and really a good 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 number is how many labels. Who are, are we actually seeing adoption for something like MIP? On the team side, uh, if, if the 
the co-authoring was the biggest one for sensitivity labels. The biggest one for teams is going to be end to end encryption for one on one calls. So uh, this is GA. If if you if I turn on uh, if I've deployed in the admin center end to end encryption and I've enabled end to end encryption on my client and the, the person I'm calling is end to end encryption, uh, that means when I make that call, it's going to be encrypted specifically for me and that person. So this will hit some regulatory uh, requirements that are out there to have end to end encryption on calls. This isn't obviously for everyone or everything, but if you have that need. There are some features that are removed when you do this, like recording the big one for one on one, but this is now available and you would turn it on in the admin center and then you enable it on uh, the client. There is a question in the chat about um, how is the sensitivity label different from data classification? Sure, I'll actually take it back to. The screen for a second to talk about it, so. Uh, the data classification. Think of that more as the the naming of the environment. Uh, the sensitivity label is actually what you deploy. Data classification is simply the language inside of the environment to say what are all of the different types of labels and the types of content that I have. So it's simply a way to navigate and discover content. And then you use data classification. You use this data classification page to go in and identify your sensitivity labels themselves. So. I'm not actually deploying anything with data classification here. Uh, I'm actually I'm using it to identify information and look at the activity and look at the overview of this information. But then really I'm going to go deploy sensitivity labels and the labels are what show up on the files. Now the, I, in those those names can come in synonymously. I mean I use that so if you could say I'm going to classify this content with a sensitivity label. So it's hard. So in the Microsoft sense, data classification is the bucket that contains all labeling. Uh, it's the, the way to find all of your labels and the sensitivity labels are the ones that you actually apply to the content. If you're talking outside of the Microsoft Act and just saying where do they enabled, they can be used synonymously, right? Like I would. When I've worked with customers and people to deploy this stuff, you talk about classifying your data. And you classify it with labels or you classify it with retention. Basically classify it with the type of label. And in the Microsoft realm, you're classifying it with a retention label or you're classifying it with a sensitivity label. And each of those labels can do specific things, but classification is more of the, the object, the mindset, the, the subjectiveness of it. Within the Microsoft stack, but it's definitely a tricky one. I, I, I end up using the I probably I felt myself stumble over some of those back and forth with classification versus label because. I uh, use the more of the classifications like the action. But in the Microsoft sense, it's the, the buckets. So jumping into uh, thinking of classification, uh, I'm going to talk about information governance some more on the compliance side. And. Under the data classification realm, you can also uh, govern your class uh, based on data classifications, also retention labels. Uh, so I can say I want to govern my data. I want to say when when should this data leave the organization? When should it stay within the and more importantly, when should it stay within the organization? And that's done using labels and policies very similar to sensitivity labels where we use labels and policies to protect it. We're going to use labels and policies to govern it. So I can say and you think about those two things together. So when I think about data classification, I could say I want to label a piece of I want to label a piece of content. With that's highly sensitive, but I also want to. Uh, but because. Of that type of file, I also want to label it with to be retained for seven years. Now technically think of that as like the classification schema of it, right? Like um, if you have an information classification policy, a lot of times that relates more to sensitivity labels and you might have a file plan that ties into your information classification policy that helps lead your information governance or data governance landscape or your framework basically saying what needs to stay when should it stay how long does it need to stay and why and that will help you meet your specific privacy and regulatory requirements but they work hand in hand we're all this all in the same umbrella uh, what's interesting is sometimes you get different you usually have different teams doing it versus a records and retention team versus like a cybersecurity team or a SOC team but um, they do follow similar similar mindsets for classifying uh, and protecting 
So the newest thing with information governance that we have is, our, is what's called adaptive scopes. So when we've deployed uh, retention labels and policies uh, in the past, we've been limited to, to locations. So I could say I want to deploy uh, retention policies to my to teams. I want to I want to retain teams chats for for six years, or I want to delete teams chat after a year, or I want to retain SharePoint sites for uh, five these these five SharePoint sites, every content in them for five years. Unfortunately, that was never dynamic. So if as as sites joined or as teams teams joined or were created or one drives were created, they would never it wasn't a dynamic process to bring them into that. And it, it was very specific to each of the applications. Now with uh, odd adaptive scopes, I can say grab me. Uh, I want to automatically retain all of my C suite content, all my C suites email, OneDrive and Teams chats for eight years. I want and or I want my my frontline workers chats to be deleted after a week because they're not really ever using it. So you can almost identify. Uh, or I want every HR SharePoint site to have content be retained for seven years because they're in HR. But you don't know what site it is. It's just the HR site. Uh, it could be any site that's HR and they could come and they could leave. So that gives us the ability to use properties to determine if they're in or out. So I could say, great, everyone with the job title of C, not CEO, everyone with the job title of executive uh, could go to a group and then anyone in that group, I could apply retention policies or labels to them. So big change, um, big update for this one. Very, very helpful for anyone who's working with retention because we were very static. We were very static with what we had to do and now we can be very adaptive. And what we get to do is we can use these attributes. So I could say people in this office, people in this department, I could say uh, these different groups, aliases. I could say uh, the most advanced one, which I love is I could actually put custom properties on SharePoint sites and say, great, every SharePoint site that is this property, it's going to give us these labels. So building out your in-place records management or building out your information governance framework is this, this opened up the door for how we're able to do it from a technology standpoint. On the Continue on the information governance side, we now have the ability to uh, retain cloud attachments. So if I uh, was in a Teams message, so if I was chatting in Teams and I sent a, uh, sent a link to some, or I sent a, uploaded a file and sent the cloud attachment, the version that was sent during that share was not, in the past was not retained. So let's say I, uh, I shared a file with, with Craig who was here, and then a year later, we went through litigation and we had to go back and look at that file. What did I send Craig? Well, technically, if there's no retention set up or if there was retention set up, it would still only grab the most recent file. It would be the file as it is today, not the file as it was a year ago. So at, with this, it will actually now retain based on that cloud attachment, uh, the file from when that con when that action occurred. Very important from an e-discovery and litigation standpoint. On the retention label and sensitivity label, uh, we can actually say, I talked about them in the data classification framework being similar. We can now actually apply a retention label based on sensitivity. So I could, let's say if we had, uh, we had content that was marked as, let's say highly sensitive dash uh, personal, personnel, like personnel files. And we knew that personnel files could never leave the organization, but we also had to say, want to make sure we keep them for three years. Or maybe a good example could be I want a year after the uh, the user leaves the organization, right? It's more of your, your GDPR requirements. Now I could say I could do both. So in the data classification schema, I could do a sensitivity label based on that label at a retention label. Very helpful. Uh, this one's very specific, but retention labels that if you created them, and you said I want to retain for a specific period. So basically if I said I want to retain content for a, a year. What would happen? Uh, if I had that set up. Users wouldn't be able to delete because I'm retaining that content. We now have the ability for a better user experience, which mean which says. If we had retained items for a year, so let's say every I want to retain my OneDrive, my CEO's OneDrive for seven years. Technically, the CEO could never delete anything. If you enable this, what would happen is the CEO deletes it, but then it goes into a, the preservation hold library. So it 
gives them a nicer user experience. Uh, this is how it's going to go by default. If you really wanted to move it, you're going to have to go change it to go off because this is just a much better uh, user experience. Uh, but the content is not going away. If you see if you see files starting to get deleted that have retention on them, they're not going away. They're just going into the preservation hold library, which they can still be fully discovered, restored, uh, however you'd like. Record labels. Uh, so staying in the retention side of this, record labels uh, are, have, are a type of retention label that are more powerful, which say you can't edit the content. So retention labels, I can still edit it. I just can't delete it. Uh, you, you're going to keep it around. Uh, Record labels say at this point I'm going to it's locked right like this, these are board minutes from today and we made a decision about purchasing another organization that has to be retained because of any because of any type of uh, litigation ever would occur you're going to know when what decisions were made in that boardroom so that file can't change and uh, but with rich record labels in the past what happened is I'd create them and the file would default to lock so I'd, I'd add the label to it and it would be locked you'd be like dang I gotta go unlock it. Uh, so now you're actually gonna have the option to start as unlocked. So now again, more on the end user experience side, not necessarily on the back end, but making it better for your users to obtain that content. One uh, kind of coming back now, even more specifically to SharePoint, uh, one of the biggest requests I get on security and appliance is around sharing and who is shared content and when. Well, who who is shared content, who is it shared to, and specifically externally. So now we have what's called data access governance reports. We have two different types of data access governance reports. We have one for sharing and one for sensitivity labels. So I can say, find me, uh, find me all of the anyone links inside my organization. I can actually go out and run that report, export that file, and see uh, see what's there. Go out and look at all of the sensitivity labels that I've deployed, uh, or sorry, the files that are labeled under this this label and who. I actually run that all inside of SharePoint and OneDrive and, and start to see the types of information. But from big one here is around sharing reports being available. Uh, and this is GA now too, so we get to run these. From an audit perspective, advanced audit is something very unique. Uh, this does come with higher licensing. If you have advanced audit, you probably got it for a reason. It's for investigations. So the big one here is mail access. So if you ever have to do an investigation, you want to see Literally, like if this account, like if my account got breached, I could go see all the emails that the users opened and try to track down uh, what type of data could have been exposed. We now have more the bigger one here is Teams. So uh, we get to see edits and deletes inside of the audit uh, for us for Teams, which will show more detail for us if we need to dive in. We also get a Yammer forms and stream, but specifically for this conversation, we get edits and deletes coming to advanced audit. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that one's there. Um, I haven't. Ha I thankfully haven't had to dive into that one yet. Uh, compliance manager at a high level. Uh, actually, I know there's other sessions here talking that have talked about compliance manager. The compliance manager lets gives the ability as a organization to see what how you're doing, uh, and actually use this as a evidence tracking system to say. Am I complying with GDPR? Am I complying with SOX? Am I complying with HIPAA? Uh, am I complying with CIS? And hundreds and hundreds more, because when you get across the globe, you get some very, very unique requirements that you need to track and maintain, right? So there's there's now one in Virginia and Colorado and Vermont, I think, has privacy laws that are specific that are now out. Um, those are actually the new regulatory assessments. So I could do like a Virginia-based data assessment the big obvious, more obvious one here is like CCPA out in California, but those all have, have types of assessments that we can do inside a compliance manager. And the bigger one for us is we, get, we now have Azure and Dynamics. So not necessarily 365 in SharePoint, but if you're using that, if you're in SharePoint and OneDrive and Teams, you're gonna kind of get the benefit of having the zero trust control families. So the stuff I talked about at the beginning comes all the way back to say, are you doing this well? So you're gonna say, how do I get started? If you're thinking about how do I get started with some any of this stuff, a lot of it can be used from compliance managers. Say, hey, you're not following our data protection baseline for security and compliance. You need to go enable sensitivity labels. You need to go enable retention labels. You need to go enable MFA. All of those are gonna get caught, and actually, you can use this as, a, as an evidence tracking system to make sure you're following uh, what are best practices out there. That might have been the most perfect times session 
of like the hundreds I've ever done. It's literally like 650 exactly. So um, with that, I mean, that was amazing timing. I, I, <laughs> I just want to pat myself on the back for that. I usually, I usually go like for like hours. So, um, and I'm around. So if you ever want, I'll put my slides up onto the, uh, up onto the teams here. And then I also put, I host everything, I host everything on my slide share. So I didn't put these up yet because uh, I made some changes this morning. So if you go to Drew Slides, uh, it's all my slides from all my sessions all the time. So I have a lot of different stuff out there to venture looking for. And that's a picture of a cat on a Friday night. Seems like a good way to warm it up. I think my cat's actually right there. I think you can see him. Kind of in the corner. <laughs> nice. Thanks again, Drew. Thanks for everybody for attending. 